Thanks. Thanks very much, Florian. Uh, uh, I'm not going to duplicate uh, uh, what's been presented already because I think m many of the critical studies have been presented. What I'm going to review in this talk is looking critically at the, the importance of good surgery, what the failure patterns are with the disease, and that we do not just have one right answer uh, in the adjuvant treatment of uh, gastric cancer. And I've titled my talk, Adjuvant Therapy in Gastric Cancer, The Evolving U.S. Approach, because we are now, uh, really have come in the U.S. to, to realize that uh, we need to acknowledge uh, results from uh, global studies and that there's not one right answer. So uh, recently we changed uh, the AJCC staging in gastric cancer to uh, uh, really changing the uh, prognosis and outcome uh, data by looking at nodal number. Uh, and in the most recent iteration of the AJCC staging, this was an analysis of 13,000 patients with uh, gastric cancer treated surgically. And uh, pretty much we can see that once, in the upper left, once you get uh, T3 or T4 tumors, your survival falls below 40%. Uh, any node positivity uh, survival f uh, falls below 40%. And obviously that's the vast majority of patients that we're, we're seeing. And these are patients that are going to be candidates for adjuvant uh, treatment. So there are three approaches globally uh, to uh, administer either adjuvant or neoadjuvant treatment uh, in gastric cancer. And uh, in the U.S. NCCN National Comprehensive Cancer Center guidelines, we now acknowledge all of these options as potentially appropriate depending on the individual patient. So uh, we just do not advocate only for postoperative 5-FU radiation. So actually one of the earliest positive adjuvant trials uh, was uh, published by Jack McDonald in 2001 in the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, this is one of the first positive adjuvant studies showing that postoperative 5-FU and radiation added to surgery improved outcome compared to surgery alone. Uh, it translated into a 10% improvement in survival. Uh, then uh, the next seminal study came from the UK uh, with perioperative chemotherapy without radiation using ECF. And this achieved a 15%, a 13% improvement in overall survival without radiation. And then the seminal studies from Asia, um, uh, it took a lot to convince my colleagues on the NCCN guidelines panel that we couldn't ignore data on 2,000 patients undergoing D2 resection without radiation, uh, but two Asian studies convincingly showing that in the setting of good surgery, adjuvant chemotherapy conveys a benefit as well. Uh, a year of S1, uh, t again a 10% improvement in five-year survival, and more recently uh, capecitabine oxaliplatin from Korea on the classic trial uh, indicating, a, again, a 9% improvement. So the survival improvements with all approaches are similar, but I will emphasize that they are modest. And I will also emphasize that I think we have continued to fail uh, to improve outcomes. And where should we go next? We'll talk about that later in the talk. So if we look at the American approach uh, of uh, postoperative 5 fu radiation, uh, the biggest impact in this study was decreasing local recurrence. Uh, the quality of surgery was quite poor. 54% uh, had less than a D1 resection, and only 10% had a D2 resection. So uh, we do continue to uh, advocate this as a standard of care, particularly in patients that have had less than a D1 resection, that 5 fu and radiation should be considered. Uh, the next study that was done in the U.S. was CLGB80101. This was a chemotherapy question. Uh, it took the standard arm of postoperative 5-FU and radiation uh, after surgery, uh, trying to see if intensifying the chemotherapy improved outcomes. So this was a comparison of 5-FU leucovorin versus ECF as the systemic therapy, and all patients got infusional 5-FU and radiation as part of their treatment. And this was a negative trial. And I think this, these are provocative data also because it indicates, at least in the systemic component, that adding platinum and epirubicin to 5-FU did not improve outcome compared to 5-FU alone. Uh, and uh, again, it, it begs the question whether intensification of chemotherapy or adding other drugs is really going to make any difference. So in the U.S. now, uh, we're about to undertake uh, a trial uh, through the CLGB Alliance, hopefully through the intergroup, uh, looking at the role of uh, PET scan imaging early on and during neoadjuvant treatment to guide therapy. Uh, this trial will focus on uh, more distal gastric cancers, patients with T3, 4, or node-positive disease that have an FDG uh, PET-AVID primary. Uh, 
will receive one cycle of preoperative chemotherapy with uh, an ECF-like regimen, and then have a follow-up PET scan. If patients have indicate response on PET scan to their preoperative treatment, they'll continue uh, uh, perioperative chemotherapy with ECF, completing the treatment and getting postoperative treatment. If they're PET non-responders, which we anticipate about 50% of the patients, they will be randomized to go to immediate surgery, followed by capecitabine radiation post-op, versus a change in systemic chemotherapy. And the change in chemotherapy will be to docetaxel or rinitecan, so a potentially a non-cross-resistant regimen to ECF. Uh, and the uh, primary endpoint is going to be overall survival, and this uh, study will be opening uh, in the U.S. Uh, later this year using PET scan to guide um, uh, the uh, perioperative treatment. So how do these different approaches fare in terms of disease control? Um, and I think th these numbers are telling because I think it indicates that th we ne really need to critically look at how surgery is performed in these studies. Again, in the U.S. intergroup trial, giving 5-FU radiation post-op, 10% had a D2 resection. Uh, local failure rates with surgery alone were 30%, and this was reduced to 20% with 5-FU radiation. And again, this was really the positive impact of treatment on this trial. But if we look at uh, Dr. Cunningham's MAGIC trial, where now 40% of patients had D2 resection, the local failure rate now, now drops to 20%. And that, that, that was the local failure pattern in the U.S. trial when you gave patients radiation. And ECF did manage to reduce that local failure rate down to 14%. Then we look at the Asian studies where everyone gets a D2 resection. The um, S1 study, surgery alone, 3%. And surgery plus S1, 2%. And the uh, Zellox classic trial, 100% D2 resection with surgery alone, it was 10%, and uh, Zellox, uh, 5%. So you can see that the quality of the surgery makes a huge difference in the surgical uh, uh, control arms in terms of local failure. So what about distant failure? Um, uh, the McDonald study, actually, uh, uh, the surgical arm had more distant failures early than the, than the surgery alone arm. Uh, it was really only peritoneal recurrence that was reduced with radiation, but distant recurrence as a first relapse was actually higher uh, in the radiation arm. In the MAGIC trial, uh, they looked at pooled peritoneal and distant recurrence, 13% reduction with chemotherapy. And the S1 trial, despite the survival benefits, uh, only a 4% reduction in peritoneal recurrence and a 2% reduction in distant recurrence. And for the classic trial, uh, the pooled uh, distant recurrence rate's about 10%. So the, the systemic therapy, whether it's given for six months to a year, has very modest impact on distant uh, recurrence. So uh, these data were presented already, but does radiation add to a D2 resection? Uh, this is the ARDIS trial in which uh, patients after D2 resection were randomized to capecitabine platinum with or without radiation, and there was no difference in either disease-free survival or overall survival with the addition of radiation. Uh, so again, uh, D2 resection, uh, uh, adjuvant chemotherapy alone uh, is an acceptable option. Uh, perhaps the subset of patients that are node positive get some benefit, uh, although it's only 4%, uh, and patients that have an intestinal histology. So the issue of whether these patients benefit from radiation is now being addressed in the uh, ARDIS-2 trial. Uh, but certainly these data, I think, uh, have impacted uh, on our practice in the U.S. Uh, patients that have D2 resection should probably get adjuvant chemotherapy alone. So what is the role of radiation? I think in gastric cancer, the extent of surgery dictates the need for radiation. We see higher rates of local recurrence with less than a D1, D2 resection. And indeed, the American approach of postoperative 5-FU and radiation is appropriate in patients that have less than a D1 resection. However, the ARDIS data suggests that if you get a D2 resection, that you should get uh, adjuvant chemotherapy alone. But uh, esophagus and GE junction cancers are different diseases. Uh, the, the results for preoperative chemotherapy alone are quite mixed. Uh, and I think the data from OEO5 are quite stunning uh, with uh, R0 resection rates of only 60% with uh, chemotherapy alone. Also showing that ECX times 4 was no better than platinum 5 a few times 2. Uh, and I think that for these patients, a combination of preoperative chemotherapy and radiation trends superior with enhanced rates of R0 resection and uh, reduced rates of both local and distant recurrence. 
the ongoing trials were mentioned. Uh, does adding uh, radiation pre or post op uh, add benefit? Uh, the critics trial uh, looks at the post operative question. Every patient gets perioperative ECX, at least a D1 resection, and then either get or not get radiation post op. Uh, the TROG trial uh, uh, with, uh, uh, done by the Australians, ERTC in Canada, looking at preoperative chemotherapy without, with or without radiation. And then lastly, the ARTIS trial targeting the node positive uh, and intestinal patients uh, to randomize them. So what is the U.S. view? Uh, well, again, I think we acknowledge all approaches now are appropriate. Uh, in less than a D1, D2 resection, chemotherapy and radiation is appropriate. ECF appears to be no better than 5-FU and leucovorin. In a D1, D2 resection, uh, increasingly uh, we're using perioperative chemotherapy. If patients are understaged with endoscopic ultrasound and they go to upfront surgery, we would give adjuvant chemotherapy with uh, capecitabine oxaliplatin uh, postoperatively. And what about RT in a D2 resection? No clear benefit. But I must emphasize that although we keep discussing over and over again these trials that have been done, we're failing. Uh, the survival impact of current pre- and post-operative therapy is marginal at best. Uh, it's hard for me to celebrate a survival improvement of 10% in all of these studies. And in the West, 60 to 70% of our patients still die of their disease. So I would argue that further large trials studying chemotherapy permutations in esophagogastric cancer are probably not warranted. We really need to start developing novel targeted agents and identifying new targets. Uh, we'll see uh, how targeting VEGF performs uh, with the uh, hopeful soon reporting of MAGIC B, uh, looking at the role of bevacizumab. Uh, the HER2 directed studies are ongoing in phase two and three uh, arena. Uh, and immunotherapy, I think, is emerging as an interesting uh, potential alternative as well uh, in appropriate subsets. We clearly, however, if we're going to enter the realm of uh, targeted agents, need validated biomarkers to guide therapy selection. And in the U.S., uh, we have now, uh, using PET scan to guide induction therapy, we recently completed a trial in esophagus and G-junction cancer using PET scan to direct therapy, and now we're going to be opening uh, a PET scan directed uh, trial in gastric cancer. Uh, you've seen this slide many times already, but I think future trials should be guided by uh, molecular subtyping uh, in uh, uh, this disease. And in particular, if we're going to think about immunotherapy, PDL1 and PDL2 expression appear to be particularly enhanced in the Epstein Barr virus subset and the MSI high subset of patients. So these may be uh, potential subgroups that might most benefit from uh, studying uh, 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 the novel immunotherapies. Thank you very much.